Hey, feeling good, like I should. When in Durku, walk around the neighborhood, feeling blessed. All right, here we go. Let's start with chapter seven. Um, chapter seven is kind of an interesting chapter in that uh, the first couple lessons, I feel like usually they like will put a few uh, random concepts at the back of a chapter just because they don't have anywhere else to put it and it loosely ties into that particular chapter. So, uh, but they don't have enough lessons to really do a whole unit on it. Uh, that's kind of what's happening right here with circle graphs. Uh, but it's happening at the beginning. Um, one thing I would say is that chapter seven for eighth grade math is the one chapter that really focuses in on data statistics and not really probability, but the, the data and statistics uh, as it relates to association where you can graph information on a scatter plot and interpret that information using all the skills that we have learned all the way through the first half of the year. Uh, circle graphs absolutely fit into that unit, but it really has nothing to do with the what we're going to be doing with graphs and scatter plots uh, later in this uh, chapter. So um, we're just going to do a little uh, lesson uh, today and tomorrow. I think our what is tomorrow's lesson? Tomorrow's lesson is Oregon. Okay, yeah. So we're jumping right into a scatter plot tomorrow and getting into the major meat of our. Um, of the unit tomorrow, um, or whatever day this is for the next lesson. But today's lesson is going to be about circle graphs, and I think it's actually a pretty easy lesson for students to understand. So let's just get to it, and it should be a relatively short video. Uh, first off, the circle graph is a data display that uh, it's a way of displaying data that can be put into categories. So if you recall, last year we talked a little bit about the difference between numerical and categorical data. The numerical data obviously has numbers, and so you can find averages, you can put information into a, um, a histogram or a box plot, uh, lots of different things you can do with numerical data, but categorical data doesn't generally involve numbers. I mean, the data itself are categories, like what's your favorite ice cream? Some people like vanilla, some people like mint chocolate chip, some people like, uh, some caramel crunch or whatever. There are lots of different flavors of ice cream. If you were to display that data, you might put it into a circle graph and it just highlight what percent of the students or what portion of the students like this kind of flavor, this kind of flavor, this kind of flavor, and so on and so forth. You could also uh, use bar graphs for the categorical data and just have like how many students on the left hand margin, like the vertical, the Y axis would be how many students like that particular ice cream. And uh, the different bars would be the different categories. Okay, so circle graphs are good for categorical data. And in order to make a, a circle graph, we have to kind of understand what's going on with the central angle. So the central angle is the angle whose vertex is uh, this at the center point of the circle. So I'm gonna go ahead and kind of show you an example of a circle graph where you would have a, a central angle. So it's like you've got maybe this is one category and you got a 90 degree angle there and that 90 degrees breaks it into a one quarter and a three quarters portion of this particular circle. And maybe you have another that goes over here. And so we might say like, one fourth of the data fits in here, one third of it is here, and one third of it is there. And so there's gotta be a way, if you're gonna make a circle graph um, by hand, to make sure that you've got this angle, the right measurement. And we're gonna get to that in today's lesson, okay? Uh, but actually, I mean, something that'll be kinda nice for you is there are websites available that allow you to just enter data into, um, into the program and it'll uh, make the circle graph for you and you can just copy and paste it or take a screenshot of it and, and whatnot. So, uh, you know, days with uh, these days with great technology makes it a lot easier to do a lot of these data displays compared to 15, 20 years ago when everything had to be made by hand. All right, so let's read through. Data can be found everywhere in the world. When scientists conduct experiments, they collect data. Advertising agencies collect data to learn which products consumers prefer. In previous courses, you developed histograms and box plots to represent the center and spread of the data. 
how can you represent data that is non-numerical and that cannot be represented on a number line? Today, you will look at a data display that is used for data that comes in categories or groups. As you work, keep these questions in mind. What portion is represented? Should I use a fraction or a percent? And am I measuring in percent or degrees? All right, so here's a situation. Nate and Rick are interested in buying a car. According to an ad in the newspaper, or whatever in the paper, they found that there were 12 cars, nine pickups, six SUVs, and three minivans for sale in their price range, okay? So if we're gonna be um, keeping track of everything, you know, remember last year when we were looking at probability, we would add up the total and the total uh, would go on the bottom, that would be your denominator. And then the numerators for like the probability of choosing a car or the probability of choosing a pickup would, uh, that number would go in the numerator. Well, this is similar to that, right? Um, so first thing we need to do is make a list write down all the numbers, then add them together. And it turns out there are a total of 30 vehicles that uh, were in Nate and Rick's price range. So now comes time to find out what is the portion, and we could express this as a percent as well if we wanted to, what portion of that total does each vehicle represent? And so if you look at the, I'm gonna go ahead and do this, uh, yeah, I'll do it in green, how's that? Okay. So the cars would represent 12 out of 30. The pickups would be nine out of 30. The SUVs would be six out of the 30. And the minivans would be three out of the 30. And so then we can simplify these because 12, nine, six, and three, those are all very friendly numbers here uh, because they're all divisible by three. So this ends up being four tenths, which is the same as 40%, three tenths, which is the same as 30%, two tenths, which is the same as 20%, and of course, one tenth is the same as 10%. So what portion do all these vehicles represent? There we go. We can write them as fractions in simplest form, or we can write them as percents if we choose to, okay? So then it says, uh, in this year, uh, I don't know that you have to, um, Download this, you could probably just draw the picture uh, in your journal, but there is a resource page that I have attached to the uh, Google Classroom if you wanted to print it off, make it a little bit easier to create a circle graph for these different price ranges and then label each section of the graph. Um, so I just to hold on for a second, I'm going to uh, do a little bit of doctoring here and then I'll, I'll come right back. Okay, so this is what that a circle graph template looks like. And so uh, it's kind of nice because uh, people at CPM, they realize that they chose these numbers on purpose so that we could have all of our portions have a denominator of 10. So it's nice for us to have the circle graph be broken up into 10 equal parts. And so what I would like for you to do is I would like for you to draw something that looks like this. Try your best to get each one of those parts equally spaced. And, uh, and just trace in the lines that would represent each portion. So uh, you got one, two, three, four of these represents four tenths of the entire circle. So if you were to create a wedge for the cars, you would want to highlight in four of those wedges and label that as cars, and you can label it as 40%. Then do the same thing for the pickups, three of the wedges for the pickups, two for the SUV, and one or the minivan, go ahead and pause and uh, use this basic template, whether you print it off and use the actual piece of paper or whether you just draw the circle in your journal and then fill everything in, that would be fine too. Go ahead and let's create a circle graph um, based on the data from that previous page. I'll go ahead and pause and do it myself. Alrighty, so I'm going to turn the page. Hopefully you've got your um, circle graph completed. If not, and you're just planning on watching what I do, that's fine too, I suppose. So this is what it would look like. You would take one, two, three, four out of the 10 sections that represents four tenths, which is 40% of the vehicles in the price range were cars, and so I've labeled it appropriately. Three of these sections represents three tenths, which is 30% for the pickups. 
the SUVs represented 20% and the minivan represented 10%. So you could have, you know, colored those in if you wanted to, or you could have just left them blank and, uh, and labeled them like I did. Now, that was really nice in that um, the circle was already partitioned into 10 equal parts. But if you don't have uh, that ability with such nice friendly portions and an already partitioned circle graph, then what you have to do is you have to actually use your protractor, use something to make a nice perfect round circle and create central angles so that they are the appropriate angle measure so that you can uh, get these wedges right. You know, for instance, right here, how do you know what that angle is supposed to be? You know, when you pull your protractor out, you go through and you set your uh, origin right on, where is that? Is that going to be right there? What's the measure that is necessary for this situation? And it looks like, do I have that right? No, I've got to get it to zero, don't I? It looks like this angle is a little bit more than 140 some degrees. So how do you determine the number of degrees um, for your central angle so that you can get all those wedges perfect when you don't already have a circle that's been partitioned for you. Well, that's where proportional reasoning comes into play. So what we're going to do is I'm going to do the first one for you, and I would like for you to do the second, third, and fourth one, okay? We're going to calculate the central angle created by each section in the circle graph. And so the first one is for cars. So what we do is we take our portion, which is four out of 10, and we make that equivalent just like we did last year when we were working with percents. Now we're gonna work with degrees. And since an entire circle, the whole circle represents 360 degrees, then the number of degrees for our wedge for our central angle will be equal to X out of 360. So four out of 10 is equivalent to some number of degrees out of 360. And so I'm looking at this thinking, well, the giant one would be 36, right? Because 10 times 36 is 360. So X has to be whatever four times 36 is. And it turns out that is equal to 144 degrees. And if you recall, when I had the uh, tractor here for that central angle, it measured, why don't I go ahead and do it again? I shouldn't have taken it off. I was a little bit uh, rushing to do that. Uh, here we go. There's the origin. Let's make sure we got that nice on the zero. And yeah, that's about 144 degrees right there. Very, very close to that. Okay. Uh, my measuring and, and this might be just a little bit off with the lines and the origin, but that, yeah, that looks about right. Okay. So, now that you know the process for figuring out the central angle, I would like for you to do the same thing for the pickups, the SUVs, and the minivans. Try and determine the number of degrees using proportional reasoning. Just set everything up just like this, but you've got your portions. The pickups would be three tenths, the SUV would be two tenths, and the minivan would be one tenth. Okay, go ahead and pause the video and see if you can figure out what the number of degrees are for each one of those central angles. All right, are you ready for the reveal? We'll just do this nice and quickly. Basically, it's this is always gonna have the same giant one, right? 10 times 36 is 360 for every single one of the denominators of these proportions. So we will always multiply the numerator or the part if you think about it like the percent proportion, times 36. So 36 times three is 108, 36 times two is 72, and one times 36 is 36 degrees. So when you add up all of these degrees, they should add up to 100, no, 360 degrees. So I'm gonna test that right now. 144 degrees for the car wedge, plus 108 degrees for the pickup wedge, plus uh, 72, degrees for the SUV wedge, and then we're going to finish it off with the minivans, which was 36 degrees, and sure enough, all four of them added together, complete the whole circle, 360 degrees. All right, so that's how you make a circle graph. Figure out what your data says, 
simplify each one of those portions and then use proportional reasoning to figure out the number of degrees for your central angle based on the fact that a circle is 360 degrees and then you use your protractor to measure it out and get it nice and perfect. And that's of course, if you don't have wonderful technology and the ability to do it online. All right, so we're done making circle graphs now. Now let's uh, interpret them. Circle graphs can be used to complete data at different points in time. Use the questions that follow analyze the two circle graphs below. So one of them on the left shows population of the continents in 1950. You can see Asia's at 54%, Europe's at 22% of the world's population, South America's at seven, along with North America, and then uh, Africa's at 9% and Australia is 1%. And I noticed they don't have Antarctica in here, probably because it's pretty much zero because hardly anybody lives in Antarctica. Uh, now, in, uh, the, this is predictive. This isn't current day, um, but 30 years from now, what do we think the population is supposed to be? Well, Asia is predicted to be at 57%. Europe has gone down to 7%. South America has increased a little. North America gone down a little. Africa has uh, pretty increased significantly, and then Australia is still uh, right around 1%. So, according to the circle graphs, which continent had the largest population in 1950 and which has the largest predicted population for 2050? Do they represent the same percent of the world's population in both graphs? And I think you can clearly see that it's Asia both times, right? And they don't represent the same percent, but they're pretty close. I mean, they're only three percentage points away from each other, but no, not exactly the same. And which continent is predicted to have its percent of the population increase the most between uh, 1950 and 2050? So Asia is going up three degrees, or three degrees, three percent. Uh, Africa, that's kind of a big jump. What is that? Nine to 22 was that's an increase of 13 percent. Are any of the others anywhere near that? Europe went down. These stayed pretty close to the same. So I'm going to say Africa is the winner. It increased by 13 percent. And it says, which continent is expected to have its portion of the total population shrink the most over this 100-year period? And by how much will its percentage of the world population change? Uh, so which one looks like it shrank the most? Europe went from 22 to 7. How much of a drop is that? About 14, 15 percentage points? Uh, uh, North America went down, but only a couple. And those are the only two that went down, Europe and North America. So we would say Europe is the winner for this question by 15 percentage points. And then it says, is it reasonable to say that continents with small percentage of world population in 1950 will have a small percentage of the world population in 2005 or 2050? What evidence from the graph can you provide to justify that answer? So is it pretty reasonable? Australia is small, it's still gonna be small. North America is pretty small, it's still pretty small. South America is small, it's still pretty small. I would say for the most part that is true with one exception. Africa is pretty small in 1950 as far as population goes, uh, but it's now almost 25% of the world population. So it went from a little bit less than 10% to almost 25%. So I would tend to agree with that statement with the exception of Africa. That is bucking the trend. All right, the world's land masses are divided into seven continents. The largest continent in terms of land mass is Asia, which is almost 30% of the Earth's land area. In contrast, the smallest continent is Australia at 6% of the world's land area. So now we finally have Antarctica represented here because Antarctica is, uh, is a pretty big land mass, almost 10% of the size of all the land in the world, but there's just nobody that lives there. That's why it was not even shown on the previous um, graph. So uh, use the circle graph at the right to help you make the following comparisons. Which continents are approximately the same size? Hmm, 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 hmm. I would say Europe and Australia are pretty close, right? That's seven and that's 6%. Anything else that comes relatively close? No, I think that's pretty much the two that come the closest, Australia and Europe. Which continent, uh, continent is about half the size of Asia? So if Asia is about 30, 
We're looking for one that's close to 15. And which one comes closest to 15 in there? I would say that would probably be North America, right? That's the one. And then which continents together make up about half the world's landmass? So, you know, where, you know, if we're going to draw our lines down, looks like that would be a line that's almost cutting this circle graph in half. Asia is 29%, Africa is 20%. When you add those together, that's 49%. And that's almost half. So, you know, answers could vary, but I would say rather than jump around and try and find which combinations come closest to 50%, I don't think you're going to get much closer than that. So we'll say Africa and Asia make up about half, and all the others combined are a little bit more than one half. All right, so I, I brought in this uh, circle graph from the previous problem so that we can compare it to uh, population of the continents in the year 2000. So it says, uh, the population of the world's people is not evenly divided over the Earth's surface. In 2009, only two ten thousandths of a percent of the people in the world lived in Antarctica, while 60% of the people lived in Asia. So where is the portion represented Antarctica's population? Where do you see it here? I notice a 0% is listed right there. I mean, if you were going to create a circle graph and, and you're going to cover 0% of that circle graph with a wedge, I mean, would, what would you see? And it, it looks like all we see is like a line. So it's practically non-existent. It's, it can barely be seen. It is so small, that wedge that would represent the population of Antarctica. And then it says, what similarities and differences do you notice about the landmass population circle graph and this problem? So what are some similarities there? What connections can you make? Well, I'm noticing that the continents with the largest land mass tend to have the largest population. And the continents with the smallest land masses tend to have the smallest population. And I think the only one that uh, really bucks that trend is the whole Antarctica thing, which if it wasn't this Arctic frozen desert kind of climate down in the South Pole, you'd probably have more people uh, living there. But, uh, and I'm sure if we were talking about the population of um, penguins, then, you know, I'm sure Antarctica would win this, but uh, we're not. We're talking about people and people don't like living in cold climates. So, um, yeah, that's the only one where the size of the landmass doesn't really seem to fit in with the trend of the population totals as well. So what did I say for my answer there? Asia is the largest landmass and the largest population. So yeah, that, that tends to be uh, what most students notice. And then it says, is it reasonable to say that the larger continents have larger populations? Yeah, it's reasonable. I mean, that does appear to be the trend, like I said, with the exception of Antarctica. That's the one that is bucking the trend. So I said this was going to be a relatively short lesson, not too bad, less than 25 minutes. All right, so um, I think there should be a check for understanding for this um, so that you can interpret and have a little fun interpreting circle graphs. And uh, then we'll go to the homework. And then tomorrow or the next lesson, we'll start getting into the meat of this chapter seven with association and data. Um, presented in scatter plots. All right, take care. Bye. Hey, feeling good, like I should. When in the pool, walk around the neighborhood. Feeling